Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. You're welcome to the Discovery Show TDS TV here on Facebook and on YouTube. This is a show that seeks to interview professionals in the diaspora and beyond who are making significant impact in the area of politics, religion, academia, and the likes. And today is another edition. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, please drop your comments. Um, please send your questions as well, and we are going to ask our guest. Today, I'm privileged to be interviewing one of my favorite people on earth. Um, I've known her for about 11 years and a great friend, a very faithful one, of course. I'm privileged to be speaking to Mrs. Irene Fusuhima Bosman Dari, the wife of my own brother, Dr. Shadrach Dari. She's a clinical or diabetes clinical nurse specialist. Irene, you're welcome to the Discovery Show. Thank you, precious. <laughs> Thank you so much for honoring our invitation. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I'm privileged to be speaking to you and I'm sure quite a number of people are looking forward to this interview as well. Just tell us a bit about yourself. I know a bit about you, not a bit, I know about you, but tell us, those who don't know you, who is Aaron Bosman? Okay, thank you Precious today for inviting me to your show. I also want to thank the TDS team, including James and also all the viewers here. So my name is Irene Bosman, as Precious has already said. Um, so I've been working as a diabetes specialist nurse with the NHS Trust for almost three years now. And currently I'm also a lecturer in nursing at Glasgow Caledonia University as well. So yeah. That is me. <laughs> Congratulations on your new appointment as a lecturer. I'm so proud of you and I'm very hopeful that greater things do await you. So congrats again, Irene. Um, just tell us, are you happy to share with us your beginnings? Where were you born? How, I mean, how was it for you growing up? What are some of the memorable childhood experiences you like to share with us? I know where you come from, but maybe some other people don't know. Yeah, just a quick one. All right. so. Definitely, I'm also from Ghana, and I was born in Achumerkropon, which is in the Ashanti region of Ghana. So um, that's where I lived my entire 25 years <laughs> before coming to the UK. So um, I attended St. Louis Senior High School. Then from there, I proceeded to Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, where I studied the Bachelor of Science in Nursing degree. So yeah, my whole family, they are in Ghana, and I'm sure some of them are watching as well, so yeah. Thank you very much, Irene. Um, you're talking about school, where you grew up and all that. Obviously, you ended up um, at St. Louis. My wife would not for, I mean, you ended up at KNUS, but I'm sure my wife would even forgive me if we don't stress that you are a slope son, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> definitely. Thank yeah. Thank you very much. I mean, a lot of commonalities between us, isn't it? The reverse is also true for me. So I'll do well to restrain myself for this interview. I mean, I mean, you came to KNUST and we were mates, obviously, but how was it for you completing St. Louis, looking forward to being admitted to the university and then you were admitted into nursing. Was it what you expected? If not, what, 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 I mean, how did you feel? Okay, thank you, Precious. So I did general science in St. Louis Senior High School. And well, I think I, I wasn't too bad. I was among the best students as well. Um, tried to partake in other extracurricular activities. So I was also the assistant chapel prefect back in school. I also joined the science and math quiz team, though I, I didn't contest, but I was part of the team. So when I finished school, whilst waiting for the results, I also did some teaching at my um, basic school at the time. So I did, actually, I didn't really want to do nursing at the university because I, that was my last choice of all the four choices. So I chose dental, medicine, um, pharmacy, then optometry, then nursing. So it's just the nursing was kind of added because I wanted to um, 
be in the clinical area so i didn't put an engineering course and fortunately or unfortunately for me i had the nurse and it was my last choice and i wouldn't say i was overly confident but i just applied to only KNUSD at the time so i couldn't have any choice of yeah so it's either i just do the nursing or reapply the following year so what i did was i just did the nursing the first year but my interest was still not in nursing so in the second year which the host will remember i reapplied to university of ghana medical school so i got enlisted as part of um, the candidates for the interview so i went for the interview and the results came i was offered but then given um a fee paying status at the time so if you know comparing a regular student and a fee paying student i mean the fees is quite it's it's there is a bit of a difference and it's quite expensive at the time so i just worked it out and i realized something that the family couldn't afford i know my dad tried so after staying there for a while i contemplated and realized that if i take this program I may struggle through because it's fee paying. So I just decided to come back to KNUST. So I went back to KNUST and continue with the nursing from the second year. So at the time I wasn't doing that great because my interest was not there. So I wasn't excelling as much. So now I had to stay focused and just accept my, I wouldn't say my fate. I did apply to UDS. I never heard from them. I don't know whether it's now that they will reply to me. <laughs> but my grades were equally good. So I think everything works according to um, the plan God has for us. So I just finished nursing and yeah, and here I am. Yeah. Great. Someone may be wondering why is this guy asking all these questions? And I'm glad you ended quite beautifully. Retrospectively, will you say, you are happy to be where you are and you think it is a plan of god for you to be in nursing or it is just by coincidence what do you think i mean at the beginning i would say i wasn't really happy with god because i felt like really with the grades i had i should get into medical school whether it's KUSD or anywhere but then chances are that i didn't meet whatever criteria it was and all that so I wasn't so happy. I felt like I have been disappointed with all the things I learned and all that. But then now I kind of realized that probably it's part of God's plan because I did try again. I didn't leave it there. I tried again. I was even thinking of applying to the China and the Russia things at a point because as at that time, more people were leaving the class and all that. But I think it was part of God's plan now. At the time, I wouldn't say it was part of his plan, but then that's why he said that whatever he's doing, you wouldn't know. So his ways are not our ways until it comes to pass. So yeah, I'm grateful. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you very much, Aaron, for seeing him out, Bossman Dari, um, the wife of my own brother, Dr. Shadrak Dari. Um, thank you very much for sharing with us. And for those of you who may be watching, you may have missed out on exactly what you wanted to do. But trust you me, in most cases, you will never know it is the will of God or where you are going. It's actually a good thing until you are finally there. And I'm glad Irene's um, actually rounded up beautifully with the scripture that, I mean, our ways are not the ways of God. So keep pushing, keep trusting God, keep doing your part, and God will definitely take you to greater heights. I mean, you are here in the UK. I mean, for me, like I said, I will do my best to ask questions as I have to. You ended up coming to pursue masters here and all that. How did that happen and what did you come to do here? So right from the start, I think I was not interested in the nursing. So even after completing the nursing, passing out, doing the NMC registration and going through the national service or rotation, I still felt like this is not where I have to be. It's not like to work in Ghana, but I felt I had to move forward or do something. I just didn't want to stay where I was. So right from the university, I think we finished our NMC exams in August or somewhere. I started working in September with a private hospital. I wasn't paid, but 
I just couldn't stay home. I just wanted to do something. So I was not paid for a while, but I was working and gaining the experience at the time. So I think my boss also did a good job. I was working at the Mount Sinai Hospital at the time, and um, I learned a lot there with all the skills and also even doing some consulting and all that. So we at the time we had established the diabetes and hypertension clinics where people were coming in every month so i was also the ward the uh, sister or charge nurse something so i kind of developed interest in the non-communicable disease aspect and also during my bsc degree i had the opportunity to come to the uk to do an elective program at the university of nottingham so comparing how they were practicing in the uk and comparing it to ghana i realized that we were far behind so i wanted that bit of experience as well so i was keen right from the start to do a postgraduate studies and you can imagine the many schools that i applied to at the time even that was in the UK alone is, is a lot. So I did apply to Brock University in Canada, Ontario. I spent all my money on graduate application fees, paying 100 Canadian dollars. I applied to University of Helsinki in Finland. I also applied to Moy University in Kenya. So it's not like I was desperate, but I wanted to move forward, whether in nursing or any health, whether research and all that. So I was just throwing my cards around. So my applications are actually traveled around the world. But I think at the long run, the common world, I got declined the first time I tried again. I think the third time I applied to about 50 schools or so, <laughs> and I got only one. That was the Glasgow Caledonia University. I did have other scholarship with the University of Nottingham and all that, but it was only for tuition with no stipend. So I decided to go for the Glasgow Caledonian, which was a master's in diabetes care and management. So that's how come I did my master's in the UK. Yeah. Many thanks, Irene Fusuhima Bosman Dari, um, who is a diabetes um, nurse specialist and now a lecturer in nursing. Thank you very much for sharing your story with us so far. Just a second. Life is a journey and sometimes can be a lonely road. When friends and loved ones forsake you, all you got to do is to be bold. I knew it years ago that those who undermined me had their minds undermined but I never mind they should keep on undermining because I'm a real good I must undergo mining. Talking of mining, it leads to discovery, we mine to discover, we learn to discover, we observe to discover, friends can uncover you at the same time discover you. But I don't want to discover you, I would rather discover more so I go on the internet and I listen to words of wisdom and intellect. Availability of information, interviews of great men and women all over the diaspora and all the issues, creativity at its best, dexterity of research, no need to go through any formal education, I introduce you to the Discovery Show, let your friends and your family know, the struggles before the blow, their highs and their lows, pay attention to this show, it will make you feel at ease, the Discovery Show on YouTube got the steez, now Perry, the presenter, please pose for the camera, I wanna hear you say cheese, we are airborne like a flu, I wanna hear you sneeze, it's true, the Discovery Show is live on air, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, see ya. TDS TV, Yen to Learn, host, Perry Precious, executive producer, James. Thank you very much, viewers. So if you are looking for bags, books, watches, footwear, and clothes, look no further than Handbag Agency. Handbag Agency. Handbag is spelled H-E-N-B-E-C-K. Handbag Agency. You can contact Handbag Agency on plus 233-546-022-952. Plus 233-546-022-952. Or Handbag Travels at gmail.com. Handbag Travels at gmail.com. Or just visit their page on Facebook 
handbag travel agency handbag travel agency they are the proud sponsors of this program so in case you need bags you need watches you need clothes you need books we need it to be shipped to you anywhere across the world just contact them we want them to buy some of these things specifically in a particular country and ship it to you anywhere or you have some goods elsewhere and you want it to be shipped to you where you are or to someone else elsewhere kindly contact handbag agency and they will do a very beautiful job for you thank you very much viewers i can see quite a number of people watching i can see dr yakubu sali for sali sali thank you very much for watching dr watch daniels hills thank you very much for watching as well um, Dr. Josephine Abouadjimins and my wife, thank you very much for watching. Um, Cornelia Blessed Bannerman, Cornelia, thank you very much. Cornelia says, congrats, Irene. Also, Jeremiah watching. Dr. Mary Abwa of Fair Mary, thank you very much for watching as well. Adrian Ponsa Udro, thank you very much. Um, Josephine, my wife says, greater high slopes. And of course, I know she'll definitely type that. Tifriti Richard, um, thank you very much for watching. Sakina Seidu Mahama, thank you very much for working. Ethel Koko, thank you also for watching. Felix Apipuri, thank you so much for watching. Nana Asamwa Masi, sorry if I didn't get any pronunciations right. Abednego, Abednego Jubi Mensa, uh, mates, thank you very much. Abednego for watching. Mercy Osu Ose, thank you for watching as well. I'll do my best to um, acknowledge all those watching once I'm able to know they are watching. So. Irene, let's talk about that. You came here to pursue your master's and then what happened afterwards? So um, I always have an exit plan as well because if I don't like to stay in, I, it's not like I don't want to stay in a place at the time, but I always think that after this, what next after this? So even after the degree, I was thinking, what next is it master's or whatever so when i was doing my master's too i was thinking of what is the next plan so at the time i had only cho two choices either to go straight to the academic pathway or also to branch to clinical practice initially i was more inclined to the academic pathway so right doing my master's and all that i was looking into phds as well <laughs> i did apply for a few phds as well and i didn't get um spend my money as well with all those applications and it's not like most of it i didn't get the funding for it so i wasn't really keen in paying school fees again so so my other option i was also looking into nursing registration with different nursing boards so i did register with the ireland um nursing and midwifery council and i registered with the uk i was also looking at australia as well so i was just thinking of where to go i wasn't sure yet um so when the ireland one came through the only thing was because i wasn't familiar with the ireland and i've been in the uk at the time so i was more um kind of want to stay here so that's how come um i finished the nmc in uk um registration so i didn't look for job straight away to become a diabetes nurse because of my masters during the masters too we did a lot of placement in hospitals so i thought i had the skills but then again i couldn't get straight to doing being a diabetes specialist nurse without having more experience here so i had to start again um so i was employed as the band three you pass your oski then you you become a staff nurse which is the band five so the band five is the starting point for most nurses when they qualify in the uk so i was working at the acute medical units uh the east assess nhs trust so i did work there for some few months and i was looking into how i'll get into the diabetes specialist Natural. So whilst as a student, I had joined the Diabetes UK professional group. I did attend some conferences and also my dissertation for the master's was also in diabetes. And I did that in Ghana where I did some small studies in um, some parts of Bronga Hafo region and the Ashanti region. So following up from there, what I noted was I wanted to become a diabetes specialist nurse, but how do I get there? 
So the inpatient diabetes team that used to come to our ward to review the patients we refer, I spoke to one of them like, I want to become a diabetes nurse, what should I do? And she was like, oh, we've even got a post that we've advertised. So if you got the skills and you've got any certificate program in diabetes, then you can apply. So that's when I applied and I went for the interview and by God's grace, I had it. So within six to eight months, I had moved from band five to band six. So I was working as a diabetes inpatient specialist nurse. So I did that for almost two years throughout the COVID and I was redeployed to the wards because of the COVID we all had to work. So I, I was working at the acute medical unit, but then still helping people with diabetes, helping the doctors in terms of managing BK and all the emergencies. So I normally take the referrals, go around the hospitals and review these patients. So those were the things that I was doing. Then another opportunity came up for a band seven diabetes nurse, but for this kind of role. So even within a specialty, you will get sub specialties as well. So I was the inpatient diabetes specialist nurse, but then there was a new role where you focus on young adults with diabetes and those using technology like pumps and all these new flash glucose meters where you don't need to finger prick. So, I felt I didn't really, it's been less than two years working with the NHS. How will I get into a band seven position? I didn't give it a try and I had it. So that was my last role with the NHS. So I was working as a band seven diabetes specialist nurse, working with a transition team where transition team is so people in the pediatric moving up to the young adult clinic. So the ages of 16, 17, 18, those were the people I was looking after and I was um, in charge of the pump service. So the technology that people with type 1 diabetes use to help them to administer insulin and all that. So I was in charge of the technology. Um, so I did had a lot of opportunities in the NHS in terms of um, leadership courses and all that. So I did the NHS stepping up leadership program as well. And I also did my mentorship, which is the Supporting Learners in Practice Certificate model with the University of Brighton. Then the last one I had was to do my nurse prescribing because if you are in a specialist role or an advanced nurse practice role, in order to become autonomous where you are making your own decision and prescribing, though I give recommendation to doctors and other clinicians to prescribe this particular drug for people with diabetes. I can't sign because I've not done that prescribing course yet. So I did get um, admission into the University of Greenwich. I mean, when the course was about to start, due to some reasons, I had to defer. So that was where I was until my current position as a lecturer in adult medicine. Great. That's very inspiring, Irene. I mean, thank you so much for sharing all these. Um, just to encourage people, especially um, overseas nurses and people who are also yet to go through the process, not only nurses, whichever area you do find yourself. I mean, as I sit back and listen to you, obviously I know these stories, but as I sit back and I listen to you again, it tells me that everything has built up quite beautifully from the time you finished school, volunteered, working, and being interested in non-communicable diseases, it's built up beautifully. And then you came here to do your master's and that has also um, served as a platform, a launching pad for you to really, really rise quite quickly. We thank God for all that. And of course, the master's would, was with benefit beyond job and all that, isn't it? Um, um, regards to Dr. Shabra Dari as well. Thank you very much. Um, the master's has been very helpful. What do you think, Ari? Good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So having said that, I just want to um, leverage on what you said. There are a lot of people here in the UK, especially overseas nesters who do not know how to move from one level to the other. How do they also rise? You said within six to eight months, you had moved from being a band five to a band six. And then within a few months, you had also moved to a band seven. 
what tips, what, what, what tips will you give to people who are looking forward to improving themselves? Um, if there's someone watching you. Yeah, so career progression in the UK. So depending on where you are, I mostly work with the NHS Scotland. There are other things I did I didn't say because of time as well. So I, I was also, I did work with the care home before even coming to the NHS, but I didn't enjoy it that much. It's not like, I just felt like it's just a, a, a fixed place doing the same things. That was for me. So I wanted to explore what the National Health Service in terms of their career pathway. So I did try the care home for a few weeks or two and I didn't go again. But what I would say is that most people working in the NHS as an overseas nurse, once you come in, you are at a band five level. But don't ignore your experiences from wherever you're coming from. So maybe some of them, when you apply for a job, they start counting your experience from when you qualify with a UK NMC. Don't accept that. Try and still bring in the experiences you had back home so that it makes your um, work experience maybe two or three years. If not, if you just started and you, you are telling them, oh, I qualified in 2020 and this is it, make sure that whatever you did in the past years is also part of your CV so that they see that it's just because you have not registered with a nursing body here. That's how come it seems like you are new to them, but you are not new. And it always takes time for you to adjust to these things, their machines and all that. Once you get used to them, there you are, you are doing your work. So right from the start, you need to know what you want to do. Do you want to be in the specialist role or do you want to be in the general roots? What I call like you are on a ward, you want to progress to become maybe a, a sister, a matron. So that is like the normal clinical practice route, senior roles, or you want to be in a specialist. So if you want to be in a specialist role, that means that at this time, there is a particular condition that you are interested in. So like I said in the other interview, any condition that you can think of, there is a specialist or an expert in that field. So if you think of Parkinson's as a disease, there is a Parkinson's nurse. If there is epilepsy, there is an epileptic nurse, there is a cancer nurse. And even within some of these diseases, there are sub-specialties nurses. So even with respiratory specialty, we can have the lung cancer specialist nurse, COPD nurse. So just think about a condition that you are interested in, in the specialist role. So what you have to do is that once you detect that you want to be in the respiratory field or the cancer field, what you have to do is in the world that you are in, make sure that um, you can become a link nurse. So in the NHS, most of these specialties, they've got their link nurses on the ward. So for like a diabetes link nurse on the ward, if we are going to do any program in terms of hypoglycemia awareness or doing an education, we fall on our link nurses in the different wards to propagate that or advertise that for us. So once we, we know that you are into diabetes activities in your ward, putting out posters for us, if there is a job interview and you bring this forward that, oh, you were the link nurse in this, not just because you've got a master's, just forget about the master because for me, I came in with the master's, but there are people I work with who are even band seven, but they didn't have masters, but it's because of experience. So look into that specialist condition that you want to and be involved in the activities. Speak to the team and once in a while, just volunteer on your off days, just join them that you want to see what they do. These are things you can write on your CV and there are free online courses. You've got a site like Future Learn where you can do anything that you want for free. And if you want certificates, you just have to pay some things more. You don't have to enroll in a big university to get these things, but you can do these small CPD courses. I know like in diabetes, if you're in the Diabetes UK website, you'll find a lot of courses that you can do. You can print these certificates and add to your CV and go for an interview. So most of us here come in with a degree anyway. So once you add the CPD courses, you are involved and volunteer, that is it. 
then you prepare yourself for the interview. Once you write your pro, um, your personal statement, let someone read it for you. Someone go through interview tips with you, and that will be that will be you. So research in that area the the top things that are there, and these are the questions that they will ask you. So you don't necessarily have to do the masters before you become a, spe a specialist. You can become the specialist and progress. Even with that, they are going to sponsor you for the masters once you are in there because they need you to work for them so they can sponsor you. So that is the specialist aspect of the NHS. And if you want to become a sister as well, if you are on a ward, make sure that you are taking charge of a shift. Once a while, just tell the matron that, oh, you want to be in charge and all that. As you're doing that, they are watching you because then you are also gaining the skills of managing the ward and all that. So you can progress to become a child nurse or a sister once it's available. And try and get the mentorship certificate done, which is easier to do now. It's like a five-day course or something, which is the supporting learners in practice course, which you can do in any of the universities associated with your NHS trust. So those are the two main sides in terms of clinical practice. And don't limit yourself to clinical practice. When you come to outside the world too, there are opportunities. So outside the world, you can be a deputy home manager. So those interested in care homes, you can use your skills later and apply for these roles in the care homes as well. There is a role called the nurses assessors role, which involves you assessing people with a disability who collect all these payments from government. So what you do is that you go to their home, assess how their condition is and write a report just to validate whether these people deserve, deserve the benefits that are being paid. So these are other roles that you can take and they start the payment from band six or band seven. So they are kind of privately funded organization which you can work with. So those are the other things that you can do as well. Yeah. Irene Fosuhima Bosman Dari, the <laughs> wife of my own brother, Dr. Shadrach Dari. Dr. Dari, I'm waiting for your message um, so that I can read it to your wife. Thank you very much for sharing with us, Irene. So, Irene, I mean, you've, you've, you've been very magnanimous. You've shared with us uh, what, what, what people can do to actually upgrade themselves. Um, I'll just go here to read quite a number of messages. I'm, I'm very excited. <laughs> Dr. Dari said, very insightful conversation. My brother, is that all you could write? Please add more. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Felix, uh, our people says, Irene, keep soaring. Hi, I wish um, to join you soon. Um, Nana Ama Ousu Fosia says, what a journey. And then Abed Nego, Ms. Uh, Ajubi Aome says, this is very inspiring, Irene. Irene is very determined. I'm so happy to see very senior colleagues here. Um, Dr. Mary Abwa Ofer says, impressive achievement, Irene. The sky is no longer the limit. Keep soaring. <laughs> And Mr. David Amia says, I could see a mischief. This is not mischief, Dave. Uh, Rahel Akoli says, so proud of you, Irene. And then senior Theo, um, Dr. Theo Akujedu, I'm happy to see you here. Um, he's laughing. I'm sure he's in relation to what I said earlier. Um, Ethel Koko says, wow, so inspiring, sis. Keep going higher and higher. Victoria Amponsa says, congratulations, my in charge. Also, Jeremiah says, Irene is a very brilliant student. Um, she's humble, respectful, godly, and diligent. She'll go far. Amen. Um, yeah, great. Um, yeah, quite a number of messages, which I'll do well to read as well. So, Irene, having discussed what the career progressions are for people who are here, we will come back to that. But if there are people watching, it will, it will not be a good work to do to have you here and not talk about diabetes or do some diabetes education. If there are people watching us who may not even know about diabetes, or of course they're educated, but obviously that is not their fault. You can take about 10 to 15 minutes to educate us on diabetes, diabetes. Okay. So, <laughs> I mean, diabetes, Everybody knows diabetes. What people related to is something about sugar, <laughs> but it's not always about the sugar actually. So, diabetes is big, and it's it's a condition that affects how our carbohydrates are metabolized in the body. So, when there is a glitch in that aspect where 
our body, normally the pancreas, which produces insulin to help convert the food we eat to the cells, is no longer producing the right amount of insulin or the insulin is faulty so that it cannot convert the excess glucose to the energy that we need. So what happens is that then there will be excess of glucose in the blood. So that is when the diabetes um, is. So with diabetes, we've got different types of diabetes and the common ones that we know is the type one and type two, but there are different types of diabetes in terms of monogenic diabetes, neonatal diabetes, and um, some gene specific diabetes, and we've got gestational diabetes. So even gestational diabetes is also common. So it makes it three main types. So with a type one diabetes, what is happening is that the person doesn't have insulin in their system. So the pancreas does not produce insulin at all. At the initial stages, there is some amount of insulin, but it's not sufficient. So what happens is that the body cells kind of destroy the pancreatic cells that produces the insulin. So there is this autoimmune destruction that causes absolute deficiency of insulin. So the person with type 1 diabetes, their survival depends on insulin. It's not on tablets. Definitely, they need insulin at a point. At the initial stages that they've got the type 1, they can be in a period called the honeymoon phase. So the honeymoon phase the, is that period where the cells can still produce some form of insulin before they are totally destroyed. But then afterwards, their survival depends on insulin. So these people will be on about four times daily insulin where they are taking a long acting insulin and insulin with the meals they are eating because insulin acts on the food to convert, to help the cells get the glucose. But in these people, they don't have the insulin. So if they eat now, they need to inject insulin. So these are the type one people with diabetes. And when we come to the type two diabetes, it's normally related to environment, family history type 1 diabetes as of now we don't know the cause i mean there could be family history as risk factors but we don't really know the absolute cause why the cells can attack itself to destroy the beta cells so that one is there but for the type 2 diabetes um it's more also family history your lifestyle as a result of weight sedentary lifestyle and all that those are the risk factors and age above 40 is also a risk factor so it runs through families and also depending on your weight and all that it can also affect that so that is type 2 diabetes and type 2 diabetes management can be a mixture of tablets and insulin so initially at the initial stages some people can use diet so they are diet controlled once they cut down on the portions of carbohydrates they are eating, try to eliminate sugar in their diets and all that, it kind of can reverse the diabetes at the initial stages. So that's why they are on diet. So they are called a diet control. But once they, they come to the phase of the active disease, then we need to start treatment with tablets. So I think traditionally the first line for most type 2 diabetes is the metformin, which is even common in Ghana. But recent times there have been newer medications, which I hope in the next years Africa will also benefit. But when you look at the current medications that has come in for type 2 diabetes, it's doing wonders in terms of helping with weight gain, improving cardiovascular outcomes, kidney outcomes, and in America, in the UK, it's now even replacing metformin as the first line. But when you go to Ghana, it's still metformin and this glycoside that we are using. So we are still a bit far behind in terms of the advancement, even in the type 2. And in type 1 diabetes, they've got pumps and devices that can deliver insulin. So they don't need to manually inject insulin because now there are machines that are doing that for them and people can use software on their phone to regulate that. So these are the things that um, 
developing countries may need to embrace in the future but i think due to resources we are not there yet as well and when we come to gestational diabetes which is also the third common one is as a result of pregnancy so due to the hormones and um the baby and all that it leads to the persons um having the condition so it kind of resolved postnatally six weeks after birth some people can have their diabetes reversed those with gestational diabetes but then we need to follow them up yearly because their risk of having the type 2 is higher so what we do is that six weeks postnatal we check up on them and a year later we check up on them with lifestyle advice and education so diabetes is big so this is just the common ones but even within that we've got the monogenic and those ones that is quite difficult to diagnose in our part of the world but here even in the uk some of the diagnoses we have to send the samples to tertiary hospitals like king's college and i know Ezeta is the one that deals with the monogenic diabetes diagnosis so it's not even even in the uk there are specialty centers that deal with these those ones that we can categorize them as either type one or type two so we've got the type three c and all that one that is related to pancreatitis or secondary to steroids so steroids are medication that we give for people to treat inflammatory condition but steroids have got side effects of causing high blood glucose levels so some people may have diabetes as a result of a medication that they are taking so common example is the steroids which we've got prednisolone and dexa that's how come we realize that during the covid diabetes people with diabetes were having poor outcomes and poor mobility because the thing is that steroids were used in the management of diabetes in the management of covid so desamethasone was used if someone have COVID, we treat with desamethasone for 10 days. So whilst they are on that treatment, their risk of having diabetes is higher. So imagine someone who has diabetes also being on steroids. So their treatments were being complicated for us. So those COVID times were very busy for diabetes nurses as well. So medications can lead to diabetes, some antipsychotics and all that can lead to diabetes as well. Yeah. Many thanks, Irene Fosuhima Bosman. Um, Dari, thank you very much for sharing with us and educating us on diabetes. Obviously, I'll ask you if you are doing a comparative analysis of the practice of diabetes. You already you've enumerated that we're having challenges back home. Um, a lot of our treatment modalities are quite outdated and we are far behind. But from what you've learned, what very practical, context specific ideas would you like to share so that? people back home, although they are lacking the various equipment and materials to use, can still implement them and get some evidence-based result. I think, I mean, most people, even in our community, some people still kind of attach this stigma to diabetes, that people shy away from the condition that, oh, I'm say, I can say, oh, I see as an offer, so they don't even, go in for the treatment and there are people selling things for people that oh no we are diabetes in the Bayra, but we are not doing the proper education right from the start and i think another i wouldn't call it a mistake but it could be due to limited resources is that it's quite difficult to diagnose the other types of diabetes so that some people they are not really type 2 diabetes but we've started giving them metformin and all that so it keeps getting worse and worse it's not improving then they are having all these conditions poor vision and strokes and high i mean hypertension and diabetes is linked so the main thing is that as clinicians we need more people in the field like we need to train our nurses after the degree and the diplomas we need to let them do these specialty courses i know that the ghana college of nurses have uh, started that when i checked the last time endocrinology is not part yet 
I know it's common for us to have the off time make nursing and all that, but now is the time that we need to train our nurses to be stroke nurse specialists, to be um, diabetes nurse specialists, all the conditions so that they get the information, then educate the patients as well. So once you are able to properly diagnose the person that they've got type one, then you know the kind of treatment that they you need to start them on. But it's like, it's general, once you've got diabetes or you come monthly, we don't even have People don't have facilities to test their own blood glucose at home. It has to be a month until they come for their next review or three months for them to know their blood sugar. So just seeing somebody one day testing their blood sugar and say it's 5.1, how will you know? You, you don't have enough data to see how this patient blood glucose is doing. I know they can do HbA1c, but not most hospitals have facilities to do that test in the communities. But I mean, big hospitals like Confanochi and Kolebu may be doing that. But what about those in the rural communities? Like when I went to Sampa is not rural, it's urban sort of, but then these, when you, you look at the, the district and the sub communities there, how do they get these things done? So first we need to make sure that there, there is a special speciality. We are training more professionals in that specialty and also resources in terms of diagnostic materials should be provided by the government. Because even if you've trained the nurses and they can have access to machines to detect or classify the type of diabetes. They will also just start treating us type two, type two gestational, but then some people may have monogenic diabetes that need some form of attention or just type one. So um, I think the government needs to support this continuously. And as a, reading through some of the articles, I think they said there is a national diabetes guideline, but I do search for it, but I can't really find anything. We, all, we still use the standard treatment guidelines, which the last time I saw it was updated was like 2017 or 2018. So there should be kind of a team, a multidisciplinary team set up just to look at diabetes and conditions separately so that they are also developing their own guidelines and matching it with international standards like the American Diabetes Association or the UK Diabetes because these people are doing intensive research and clinical trials with newer drugs which are effective but because we don't do any trials you're not even able to assess whether these drugs will be beneficial for our community or the people as well. So it's a whole lot, but I think we can start from somewhere by training people in the field and also providing diagnostic materials. Then we can educate the public about diabetes so that they don't shy away. They need to take their medications regularly. It's not like we need to let them know that it's a long-term condition and long-term condition you take um, medications in the long term it's not something that you need to stop so once that has been explained to them they will take it serious that's what i think yeah. many thanks Aaron, for so him our boss man i mean spot on i think we've had I mean, some conversations along these lines and Thank you very much for highlighting it for our viewers as well. And I mean, uh, an aspect in the field, I'm glad that you've been able to contextualize all these things for our use. Thank you so much, Irene Fosuhima Bosman Dari, um, who is a lecturer um, in adult nursing, basically, or lecturer in nursing. Quite a number of people watching as well. Rahel Akoli, um, Reta Insia, Lili Daku, um, Doka Sopokwa Jumai. I can also see. Prince J. Bafour, um, Emmanuel Ekbo, um, he says, please kindly get um, Professor Samoa Trim on board in your next session. And I've replied that please watch out for a surprise soon. Watch out, it's coming very soon. I can also see Felix Apipuri says, so amazing. But Irene, please, if you could share your contacts to assist um, in the application process to the UK. 
I'm sure Irene will share some details with us um, before she leaves. I can also see my sister Eunice Amosa. Thank you very much for watching as well. Um, Frank Abwajemisa, thank you very much for watching as well. Um, yeah, I think those are the people I can see here. It's unfortunate I can't see everyone watching. So I would really appreciate if you can just drop a comment, just a message so I can acknowledge you. I would really love to acknowledge everyone watching as well. Irene, I mean, I have had quite a number of people asking me about um, whether to work in NHS or to work in care homes here in the UK. Um, let me be quick to add that you haven't worked in a care home as far as I know, but from what you know, are you able to compare them so that for people who, who may want to decide on this, especially back home and intend to come here, do you have anything to share with them? <laughs> well, when I, I get that question, I always say that I think it's an individual decision, but I just highlight a few things. I've, I didn't really work in the care home for long, but I just did some few shifts there. What you need to understand that a care home or a residential home or a nursing home is just a facility where we've got patients transferred there because um, they need support, daily support for their activities of daily living. They can't take their medications or they need some nursing input in terms of maybe people who are on long term catheters or they are on feed that needs to be administered intravenously so they need assistance so when you're working in these facilities most times it's either they've been discharged from the hospital permanently to the home because they require this ongoing nursing care so basically these are the things that you'll be doing giving medications um, making sure that you're assessing them for falls because most of them are older patients some have got background dementia and all that so most of these patients are vulnerable and you need to protect them from falls and also make sure that they don't have in they have less infection because i mean they've got poorer outcomes in terms of everything due to age and all the associated comorbidities so for me in the care homes and residential homes it seems it's kind of a general practice there. Most common conditions you can come about maybe will be the dementia and the Alzheimer's. So you can take an interest in that area and maybe develop a specialist route from there. But then comparing it to the NHS, which is the National Health Service, is, is a big health organization and there are so many opportunities. So first, I asked you whether do you want career progression or you just want to work in that you can get your money and get your life going. If it's just all about getting your money and survival and all that, and you're not thinking about other specialties to be exposed to, then you can go to the care home because maybe that's what you want to do. And you can find conditions like dementia and all that, that I've mentioned. But if it's your plan for you to be exposed to a wider range of opportunities in terms of nurses teaching as clinical facilitators, um, different specialties and roles, those who are just at the discharge line, they are just coordinators. So because it's a big hospital or facility, you've got different departments where nurses can have a lot of roles so you are exposed to many opportunities so that's when you can weigh that oh actually i think i like this part of nursing or i think i want to become a manager or i think i want to teach clinical practice i, I think i want to support overseas nurses training with oskies and all that but if you are in the nursing home probably your exposure to these opportunities are not a norm, it's not a lot. So you are kind of restricted. So you need to decide. And it's not like once you work in the care home, you can't work in the NHS. You can start from the care home. And if you feel you're not getting fulfilled, you can always change. So it doesn't really matter where you start from. You can always change where you're working. You can even change to academia. So 
is the starting point. So just choose what you want. If you want exposure to different roles and conditions and in the acute setting, then you need to go to the hospital or the NHS. But if you want just normal nursing, daily routine things, then you may want to explore a residential home nurse. Yeah. Many thanks, Irene, for switching my boss man. How has the transition been for you from clinical practice into academia? How has it been? I know it's been it's been few few weeks, but how has it been? <laughs> well, I'm still finding my feet in in teaching and all that. I mean, it's 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 okay. More of is what you've done in practice, and you are teaching nursing students. So. It's not, it's just finding your way how to balance your time. I know it's kind of a big change working in a different setup now into academia, supporting students, using all these online platform and all that. Whereas, so I used to deal with patients, consulting and just prescribing or asking GPs to prescribe, do this. Whereas here, I'm impacting knowledge. So it's, it's similar, but then the audience have changed. So I just need to make sure that um, I know what I'm asked to do or whatever module I'm teaching. I know the learning outcomes and I deliver. So this is also another route in nursing that you can look at if you want to um, teach or become a lecturer. It's something that you can explore and it's a route you can use to do your PhD or if you want to do any um, professional um doctorates in a health science or anything that is something that you can do as well fantastic thank you very much and congrats once again on your new role um so generally how how do you manage life here in the uk now you're a family woman married to my own brother dr shadrach dari um, Dr. Adari, I'm still waiting for the updates on your message. Um, other than that, I'll have to compose one for you. But um, how, how do you manage stress, family life? How do you keep in touch with people? I know you are very, you do well to keep in touch with quite a number of people. How do you manage all these things, Irene? <laughs> well, I think um, I wouldn't say it's, we are, we are all growing and trying to manage things so it's kind of multitasking so um back family is still back home you you get in touch via whatsapp most times when i'm off during the weekend i tend to speak to um my parents and my siblings as well and here i've got friends i've got a community like you you have church friends and colleagues that you can speak to it can be stressful sometimes, especially when somebody sends you a message and in your mind you think that you've replied, but actually you go by two days and you realize you didn't reply because something came in your way. So it can be difficult. So because okay. it could be that you are at work, you saw the message, you were about to type, then you had a phone call from a patient, you left it there because it's breakover then you forget so some people may think that oh you just don't reply messages or you're always busy but sometimes it's just because you are doing other things so it's in your mind but you forgot to reply so sometimes i just have to apologize and say that and i always tell people that if i said i'll call you and i haven't just please call me and just go straight to the point and i know i used to fight with my little brother about that he come and say hi and waiting for me to come and say hi, <laughs> and come and say how are you? And I'm like, please, just go straight. What do you want? Just let me know because sometimes you, you don't have the time with this back and forth conversation. So when people want to reach out for things, I mean, even with new people, you just introduce yourself and say that maybe you came across this message or you need help with your application. Can you help me? But if you just type hi and especially when I've not saved your contact and I come and reply, hi, it would take another, maybe you are also offline, you come and see us, how are you like? 
it takes <laughs> time. So just <laughs> make life easy for all of us. <laughs> I mean, I think I think it's a great um, subject. We need to literally um, delve into a little bit more. And um, I mean, I mean, for for our brothers and sisters and friends and all people watching us, life anywhere could be very stressful, including the UK. And like Irene is saying. I mean, sometimes you really love to reach out to people and all that, but a message is sent, genuinely you've read it and you, 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 in your mind, you thought you had answered or you know, I'll answer this later, but before you realize, I mean, the pressures of life take you away. It is not intentional. And also, I, like Irene said, I'm just rehashing this because for me personally, I've had quite a number of issues in line with that. And I'm sure you've had similar ones, Irene. Sometimes someone will send you, I mean, someone you basically don't know, but obviously, I mean, it's a community. Send you a message on Facebook, WhatsApp, like you're saying, hi. I mean, you are not able to respond, not intentional. And I think this is something that is somehow cultural. I mean, if you, if you disagree, that's fine. But I think we are used to the, 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 the conversation line of saying, hi, how are you? I'm fine. Then, you know, that kind of chat. But I think that only works, especially if you are very close to the person. <laughs> so just go straight to the point. Hi, Irene, how are you? My name is this. I saw your number here or I got in touch with you through this medium. I need this and that. Once the person sees that, he or she will prioritize an answer. So um, please don't take it as people rejecting your messages and not responding. It, it can really be hard. So yeah, that's about, thank you, Irene, for um, highlighting that. So, I mean, do you have any words to share with us? We're almost coming to the end of the interview. Do you have any, anything I haven't asked you about you think is on your heart you like to share with us? It could be any of the things I've asked you, but you really want to um, still rehash or still repeat that. That would be fine. Well, I think that Another thing that I would like to say is that, I mean, our paths are different. So I know maybe you you want to do something. It could be that you also start from, like, I did a master's before I came into the diabetes. So probably that also helped with my progression being quicker. It could be that you don't have a master's, you've only come to the UK with a diploma. So now you are working, what you need to do is that you, you want to upgrade. So you need to do enroll and maybe do your top up degree. Don't stress yourself, give yourself time and think that you are not in any competition with anybody. The competition is with yourself and making sure that you are achieving the goals that you need to achieve. So don't let anybody give you pressure because that makes it more stressful. So like I said, everybody has a purpose. So as a Christian, I know that we've all got purposes that God wants us to achieve. So it could be that you started with nursing, but I know some people who started with nursing, but they are now doing businesses or doing other things so we all can follow the same route and i always say that if all of us leave ghana and come here i'm saying ghana because i know i'm from there and people are, and our parents are still there who are those looking after our parents so i am here when my mom is not well i am shaking like because is it because i don't trust the health system if all of all of us can't be here but it doesn't mean that if you are there and you feel you're not comfortable, you don't move. You just have to move. So wherever you are, if you feel you are making, you are achieving your targets there, then that's fine. But if you need to move for you to be fulfilled, then you need to move. But don't be stressed or feel like you're in a competition with anyone. I mean, just chart your own course, speak to your God, and if it's in line with his plan for you, then definitely you will succeed. It could be that you apply for the band six rule, even when you've, you've got a master's and all that, and you wouldn't get it. So it doesn't mean that you do A, B, C, then you get D. Sometimes it doesn't work. Like I said, I did apply to a lot of schools I was interested in. I wanted a PhD. I applied to the Wellcome Trust with Cambridge. I didn't get it, but it doesn't mean that um, 
you will be disappointed with some of the rejections and some my first diabetes role i applied to one month i i traveled all the way from glasgow to down south for the interview and i didn't get it but then it doesn't mean all hope is gone you just need to apply keep applying if that's where your interest is so don't give up easily and don't give yourself too much stress and competition just take a step at a time and try and make sure that I wouldn't say put your your eggs in one basket just spread it across because when I was doing the UK and MEC, I was also doing Ireland because for me it's just finding the next step for my life I wasn't clear that I want to be a diabetes nurse or I want to do a PhD I wanted to weigh which one would work so um I didn't get the PhD so what next I can do clinical nursing so don't stop there just keep moving until you get to your destination and i think that with god on your side you will succeed as well yeah thank you very much Irene fosuhi my boss mandari and there's a saying that persistence breaks resistance who told you that persistence doesn't work this is the message from your husband dr shadrach dari he has definitely sent it and that is amazing. So Dr. Dari says, Irene seemed to have a special grace to identify where the ceiling is and then smashes it. Very proud of what she has achieved and is indeed an inspiration for all nurses to dream, to rise, to achieve. Come on. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Shadrach Dari. And of course he says, you are still not forgiven for not returning my call since Monday, precious. Of course, my brother, I'll, I'll return it. So sincere apologies again. I have to apologize to you officially here. And then Dr. Theo Akujedu Senior says, Bournemouth University has lost a gem. Please come back in the future in a different role. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Akujedu, you, you talk about that. You talk about that. <laughs> Thank you very much all for watching. And yeah, quite a number of people watched Irene. I think I thought you are one of my favorite people on earth, but you still have very um, a lot of people who really love you, including your husband and, and any other person you could think of on here. So thank you very much, Irene Fosuhima Bosman, for those inspirational words you've spoken to us. I have known you for 11 years. And on under no circumstance do I think that you have a limit to what you can achieve. So keep pushing keep going, God is with you. Um, and of course, I believe that in few years to come, you will be a global figure. So keep going and we all love you. We hope that um, you will definitely, definitely hit the mark. Thank you so much all for watching. I am amazed that we really do not have questions for you. Um, it, 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 it's really depicts that you've really explained everything quite clearly. So thank you very much, Irene Fosohima Bosman. Um, and I'm glad that even though we've gone over the time, uh, about 10 minutes, we still have quite a number of people here. That is the love for you. You want to say anything to them, anything to your husband as well? <laughs> hey, precious. <laughs> well, I just want to say thank you to the TDS team for having me. I know I've been dodging this show for a while, but I couldn't dodge again. And I thank you for all the viewers as well and everybody listening. And yeah, Precious want me to say something. So I was, <laughs> yeah. And I thank my family and my husband as well for being supportive. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Dr. Dari, of course, I did a good job for you, isn't it? I've, I've made sure that she has said something. So thank you all and look forward to our next interview next two weeks. Um, it's going to be another surprise, another surprise. So thank you very much, Irene, for seeing my boss, man. I would love to speak to you over and over and over again. But obviously, because of time, we are not out of words, but because we are out of time. So thank you, Dr. Thiwa Kujedu. Officially, I'm still looking forward to um, having you on the show. Um, Dr. Salit. Looking forward to it. Dr. Dari, I'm looking forward to having you here and all the other people here. So God bless you and um, hope to see you next week. Thank you, Irene. Um, God bless you. Uh -huh.